Thanks, Josh. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you this afternoon and to talk to you a little bit about um, a novel way of thinking about clinical research. If you've heard from Josh's brief biography, and if you can tell that I talk a little differently than Mayor Price, you know that um, I don't come from Texas. And in fact, just before I got to Texas, I was here near Mount Everest working for the Himalayan Rescue Association. And there are a lot of things you learn about being in the mountains. And there's a lot of lessons that I think translate well uh, into many uh, walks of life. And one of my favorite quotes is this one from the famous Scottish mountaineer W.H. Murray. He said, the moment one commits oneself, then providence moves too. Whatever you can or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And I want to talk just briefly about two things, a little bit of providence and a little bit of boldness. Providence is shown by these two men. I'm extremely fortunate to have people like Jim Knockle and Mark Feldman, the Chiefs of Medicine at Texas Health Presbyterian, as my mentors, and people like Doug Hawthorne, um, a visionary CEO, uh, to support our work. And uh, together, we were all quite bold. We built something called the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine. This is a unique public-private partnership between Texas Health Resources and UT Southwestern. And our mission is stated here. Our mission is to promote basic and clinical research, education and clinical practice, and defining the limits to human functional capacity in health and disease with the objective of improving the quality of life for humans of all ages. That's a pretty bold mission. And um, I, when I try to describe how we do that using a... a, a branch of medicine called physiology. I like to use these Chinese characters which uh, define physiology. They, there are three of them, life, logic, and study. So physiology means the study of the logic of life. And how many here in the audience know what the term personalized medicine? You all heard that term before? Raise your hands, yes? Personalized medicine, and usually you think of genomics, right? the genes, and you've heard a lot about genes, you'll hear a little bit more in the next session. But I'm here to tell you that genes isn't it, isn't all of it anyway. So here's two creatures, caterpillar and a butterfly, are same genes, same genes, but different phenotype. And in fact, there's a whole field of science about how you regulate the genes and determine what's supposed to happen to that genetic code. Once those genes are transcribed, you have to make proteins, and then you have to fill that soup with met metabolites as it circulates around different organs. And the reductionists take things apart, and I think that's great. And basic science is sort of like taking apart a car to figure out how every little piece works. And you can do that, and then at the end of the day, you're, you're stuck with a, uh, um, a bunch of pieces around, and you, what you really want is a car that works like that. My friend Mike Joyner gave um, the Adolf Lecture at the American Physiological Society from the Mayo Clinic, and Mike, uh, using uh, some uh, verbiage from a great Texan, asked this question, um, the giant sucking sound, can physiology fill the intellectual void left by the reductionists? Physiology puts it together. Physiology is the bridge between the reductionists on one side and the epidemiologists on the other who look at population health as a sum total of uh, everybody in the population, but not at individuals, because our patients are not yeast in a petri dish, and we as physicians are not bookies betting on odds ratios. As doctors, we have to take care of patients one at a time. So I would like to introduce you to a new omics, that is physiomics, how we put things together. And at the Institute for Exercise and Environmental Medicine, we've recruited some of the world's best experts to address this problem, and we've aligned ourselves along the oxygen cascade, the path that oxygen takes from the environment through the lungs, heart, into the skeletal muscle and controlled by the brain. We have Dr. Jeff Stone, who runs our hyperbaric medicine unit, Tody Babb, who's our respiratory physiologist, Ron Haller and Alan Martin, who study neuromuscular diseases, Chi Fu, who runs our women's heart health lab. I'm a cardiologist and cardiovascular physiologist, and I study both cardiovascular and high-altitude physiology. Craig Crandall runs our thermoregulatory lab, and Rong Zhang studies cerebrovascular function, how does the brain work, and, and its effects on cognitive function. We have a huge number of fellows. People come from all over the world. Right now we have 19 postdocs from eight different countries. And 
since 1992, we've trained over 200 physicians and scientists from around the world. And we have a wonderful staff who are the ones who actually do all the work. Now, I've been quite proud of a number of things, um, what we do. We've been quite productive. We've uh, published about 500 papers in our first 20 years, about 100 reviews and book chapters got lots of protocols, many funded grants, and almost $47 million in research grants from a number of different organizations, both public, private, and industry. Perhaps the thing I'm most proud of, though, is this next slide. And this shows the number of citations over the time that we've been uh, open, since 1992. Citations are when other scientists cite your work as being an important underpinning their work. And you can see that over the last 20 years, we've rapidly accelerated to over 1,000 citations to our work in the medical literature every year. And uh, I'm pretty proud of that. So what I want to do is just spend the last five minutes giving you a little hint, a little taste of some of the work that we do. Now back in the, in, in the 1960s, 1966 for example, the most famous study in all of exercise science was done right here in Dallas. Now I didn't do that, I was only 10 years old at the time, but my mentors Jerry Mitchell and Gunnar Blumquist led this effort and they took five young men and they put them to bed for three weeks and they measured their maximal oxygen uptake. They measured like a billion things. The maximal oxygen uptake though is this maximal rate that oxygen fluxes from the environment down to the muscles. Think of it as an index of fitness, if you will. And you can see that every single person, there were two of them that were quite fit, three were average fit, and they all became less fit after three weeks in bed. Well, in the mid-90s, we found those same five guys and brought them back to Dallas now 30 years later, and we tested them again. And we found that not a single person, not one, was in worse shape after 30 years of aging than they were after three weeks of bed rest in their 20s. So in other words, three weeks of bed rest was worse for the body's ability to do physical work than 30 years of aging. Now our lab has been quite interested in trying to figure out why that might be. What are those changes? And we have a fairly complex and high-tech environment. We, in many of my studies, I uh, will put um, a heart catheter in the arm, slide it up into the heart to measure pressure within the heart. We use echocardiography to measure the volume of the heart. We use this gravity box here to suck blood into the feet, unload the circulation, and make it empty, and then we'll give a rapid saline infusion. And we can stretch the heart and feel its compliance, its flexibility. And then we use MRI to look at the mass of the heart. Now in 10 minutes, I don't have a huge amount of time to tell you all the studies that we've done. Um, but we've done lots of studies looking at both ends of this equation. For example, We've done studies putting people to bed for two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks of bed rest. That means you can't get up even to go to the toilet for 12 weeks in bed. And if there's a sign-up list in the back for people who want to volunteer for the next study. And you can see that the size of the heart, that's what these bars represented, the muscle mass of the heart gets worse, gets lower by about 1% a week. I mean, it just continues to go down, 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 and down. And conversely, we've trained people for a year to become marathoners, and the heart gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you try to ask yourself, what are the outer limits of this? So, for example, spinal cord injured patients, or perhaps patients with a unique disease called POTS, we'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, or elite athletes, and you can see that the longitudinally about a third of the heart, cross-sectionally, 75% of the heart's muscle is adaptable, plastic, responsive to changes in physical activity. So we asked ourselves, what would happen, what would happen if while someone was in bed or deconditioning over time, they were to do exercise training? And what, in particular, what would happen during aging? So that was a major set of studies for us, and we took a group of elite master's athletes, all over 65 years old. They had to be training for 25 years, and they had to exercise more than 20 miles a week, and they had to be competitive at a regional and national level. And then we compared them to a group of very healthy but sedentary seniors who exercised less than 30 minutes a day, less than three days a week. And what did we find? Well, this is a bit of a complicated slide, but it's not as complicated as you might think. The x-axis is the volume of the heart, and the y-axis is the distending pressure. How much pressure does it take to stretch the heart? 
the stretchier it is, the more youthful and more compliant it is. So you can see this is the young individuals and our sedentary seniors. The curve is shifted up and to the left. So it's steeper. And for any given pressure, the heart is much smaller and the pressure rises much faster. So this is a small, stiff heart, even with healthy aging. What do you think happened to our healthy elite masters athletes? What do you think their hearts look like? Absolutely superimposable to the healthy young. That is, a lifelong training at the level equivalent to be a master's athlete is completely protective against this aging response. And that's, so that's great, but you know what? It's not a very good public health measure, right? To ask people to do this amount of exercise. So our next set of studies, we asked, how much exercise do you have to do over a lifetime to protect against this stiffening of the circulation. And we defined, we went to our friends at the Cooper Clinic and collaborated them. We defined to people who were sedentary, no, we did not study Dick Cheney. He's just an example of a sedentary person. But we took people who, we, what we did were called casual exercise, two to three days a week, committed exercise, four days a week, and competitive athletes, six or seven days a week in competitions. And this is the slide I just showed you, and here's our new data. And you can see, actually, it's pretty close. Here's our elite athletes, and here's our sedentary individuals, upward and leftward shift. What do you think the casual exercise, two to three days a week? Not much of a change in cardiac stiffness. But how about committed exercise over a lifetime? That's much better. Four to five days a week gets you almost as much as being a competitive master's athlete. So that's a much better public health answer. Now, um, the next question is, what does this have to do with space flight? Or maybe conversely, what does space flight have to do with aging? And you all remember when John Glenn flew in space in celebration of his 40th anniversary. NASA used that to emphasize that space flight is actually quite, has a lot of similarities to aging. The heart gets smaller and stiffer. The muscles get weaker. The bones get more fragile. So there's a lot of similarities. And we've done a lot of work over the years in short duration space flight, doing some very complex experiments, and more recently on the International Space Station. And again, I don't have time to go over all that data with you, but I do want to share one Earth-based uh, outcome of this space flight research. And that is uh, a unique group of patients who have a syndrome called the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And we've affectionately suggested a new name, the Grinch syndrome. Why? Because their hearts are two sizes too small. And they actually literally are two sizes too small. Here's the mass of the hearts of men, healthy women, and patients with POTS literally two standard deviations below the mean. And when you put them on a training program, we exercise them using rowing, we completely cure them. And it's remarkable. I get hundreds of postcards from around the world of women who were incapacitated. And I just want to share you one personal story. This is the, my last uh, set of slides here. And this is a young woman here who um, was a dancer at Ballet Austin. And, uh, she was completely incapacitated, came to us, had not been out of this supine wheelchair in two years. And after uh, four months of uh, or the special program we developed for astronauts, this is a picture of her just before she gave a speech at her uh, ballet that she choreographed at uh, Ballet Austin. We also worked with the Chilean miners to help get them up to keep them from dying. That's a whole other story that I'm um, being told I'm out of time. So I want to ask you, leave you with one question. Josh, one question, okay? One question. If you could take a pill that would increase your strength and endurance, reduce your risk of diabetes, heart attack, and stroke, prevent cognitive decline, the development of Alzheimer's disease with little or no side effects, would you take it? Yes. Thank you.